Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Dan Helley, welcome to the show, man. Appreciate it. We were, we were, uh, we're kind of cohorts and work, we worked together. We called a game. You did play by play. I did color. Uh, what's going on, man? Dude, I'm just uh, here in my hotel room. I have a quiet moment here during uh, Super Bowl week. Um, yeah, that was a fun. That was a fun college game down in uh, down in Texas. I hope we get to uh, get to work together again. I love doing the play by play thing because it gets you out there in the mix, out of the studio. Um, you, you know, you're kind of part of that that energy and the vibe of a game, which is very cool. I think that's something. So you're, I think you're well known for a lot of the studio shows you do. How long have you been doing play by play? I probably started about three or four years ago and uh, started out in uh, L.A. where I live and did a couple of high school basketball games. <laughs> and then I did a high school football game. The uh, the local regional sports network out there that does the Lakers and the Dodgers, um, they do the high school state basketball tournament. And it's kind of that was kind of part of the Lakers deal, I think. And I uh, just got my feet wet doing that. And that led to. Um, a couple other things, and eventually got the the Tennessee Titans preseason TV gig, and a couple of Fox games, and the games you know, we did for Facebook, and um, and now I'm doing a couple more college games uh, from a basketball standpoint. So it's great, man. You know, you know better than anybody. You got to diversify that portfolio, brother. Was that? Did you always want to do play by play, or is it just the fact now that if there's no one, no one's like just a writer now. No one's just a studio guy. They kind of do everything. Is that what you were trying to do, or was play by play always a, a goal? N- no, I'd, I'd never even thought about doing play-by-play. I always just wanted to do the TV side. And um, I think in the last three or four years, as I've seen our business kind of change and evolve, the guys that are really good um, can do a little bit of everything. You know, Bob Costas was, was doing play-by-play. He does studio hosting. You know, Mike Tirico can do a little bit of everything. So, um I want to keep doing everything that I'm doing, but give me more. I'm just trying to gobble it all up and just, you know, just learning as I go. Well, uh, what was very impressive for me, so I saw it firsthand. For people that don't know, play-by-play guys calling in football games have a spotter next to them that will help help them ID, say, who made the tackle, who caught the who caught the touchdown, whatever's going on. And probably an hour before the game that you and I called, they came, oh, in, right. they came in and said, oh, yeah, hey, Dan, sorry, the spotter got sick. Um, and so I remember, I even, I think I asked the guy, all right, so they send it, who, who's going to be the spotter? And they said, oh no, there's, there's no spotter. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that, dude. Yeah, that was, uh, we have a special kinship then. I think that's the only football game I've ever done with no spotter. And you just rolled with it though. They, they came in and if you were flustered, you definitely didn't show it. You said, all right, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, we're good. And I'm thinking, I was like, man, I'm, I'm just doing color here. I don't really need to ID the guys the second that something happens. And I'm thinking, how the hell is this going to work? But it, it, the game went off without a hitch, and it was Southern Miss at Rice. It's usually, unless you're a fan of, a diehard fan of those teams, you most people probably don't walk around knowing a whole lot of guys in those, yeah. about those squads. Yeah, I know. You know, you, we both did. We had to kind of bone up before the game. <laughs> and luckily, I had done one Southern Miss game before that, but I wasn't overly familiar with Rice uh, from that standpoint. And that's – you're right. It's not. They're not two top twenty-five teams, you know, from uh, you, you know the SEC or the Big Ten. So yeah, you had to kind of teach yourself throughout the week about those dudes. Yeah, that was that was an impressive feat. No one, I didn't, I couldn't tell you didn't have a spotter the uh, throughout the whole game. It was it was a fun deal. It was fun working with you. I know. So you do basketball too. What's what's harder, basketball, football for uh, for play by play? I always like to ask you guys. I think that football. There's a lot more preparation that goes into it, just obviously because there are more players. Um, basketball is it's so much faster that when you do a team that you haven't done before you really don't have a lot of time to look down at your at your board and you know your basketball board's much more simple right i just use a manila folder and draw a couple lines and and um you know there's going to be 14 15 guys on a team and there's going to be max 12 to play right so it, the first like 10 minutes of a basketball game for me are tough when they're two new teams, because I I've gone to shoot around in the morning. I've talked to the coaches. I know the guys, but you're not overly familiar with, with the numbers. Right. And it's, it's a fast break. There's three passes. There's a dunk. Um, so it all, I always wait a beat before I identify the guys just to make sure I get it right. And then after about 10 minutes or so, then you can just talk, you know, Thompson to King, you know, for three or whatever it is. 
but initially you just want to make sure you're not screwing up those names. What about jumping in and doing MMA with the UFC? You did Dana White's what, Tuesday Night Contender Series. Yeah. And you're calling fights with your color guys, Daniel Cormier, the, the champion, who does a very good job on TV as well, calling a lot of the fights when he's not the guy fighting. How would it, like, was that intimidating? Well, it was crazy for the, um, so there were three, there's three guys that I've worked with. In my audition, I worked with a guy named Alan Joban, um, who handsome, I like to a Handsome yeah, bastard, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's winning life. He's a Versace <laughs> model and an MMA fighter. Can you get any better? Than, living in LA, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Alan was awesome. They connected us via email and he called me within five minutes. He's like, hey man, there's, there's uh, a card this weekend. Do you want to get together and watch it? And we can even kind of like, practice maybe what we're going to say or you you know i could ask you questions you could ask me questions and my initial thought was like wow i just met this guy in email five minutes ago and then i'm like this is awesome like this guy really wants to do this i said absolutely i said let's do it like come down to my house we'll watch so we watch fights for uh probably two hours and he kind of like boned me up on um certain things in in ufc that were important and um you know just different moves and stuff that i wasn't overly familiar with so a week later, two weeks later, we went in for our audition. Alan was great. There were probably eight or nine other teams that were trying out. And uh, somehow I, I got it. Um, and I got paired with Eve Edwards, the thug jitsu master, who is one of the early pioneers of MMA. And um, so Eve and I did four of the events. And then uh, Brendan Fitzgerald was uh, paired with somebody different. Uh, they did four of the events. And then Snoop Dogg called the events as well. So Snoop did the Snoop cast with Uriah Faber, and you could toggle in between. I called mine the straight cast, right? The straight cast and the Snoop cast. And, uh, and then I did the uh, Ultimate Fighter uh, 26 finale. Um, that was the one where, they, uh, where it was all women in the house. Um, and that's the one I called Cormier, and we did that one uh, in Vegas. That wasn't at the Tough Gym. Um, that was, you know, I had a big crowd, and that was my first one uh, like that. And Cormier could not have been any cooler. Um, love that dude. He he actually had – there was a big college wrestling tournament. You know, he's a great wrestler at Oklahoma State in the Olympics. And he had his uh, college buddies who were all coaches all over the country, like 12 of them uh, in town with their teams. And he took them all out to dinner. And he's he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't have any plans. He's like, you want to come out with me and my boys? And – so you just, I just sat there at the table with all I'm listening to him tell college wrestling stories. So it was, it was awesome. And, of course, Cormier picks up the tab for everybody. So I couldn't have been happier um, to see him win. And, I, dude, Cormier, like, trying to, t trying to hold a belt in two weight classes, this is going to be unbelievable. Yeah, man, he's fighting Stipe here uh, July 7th, I believe. It's during, like, International Fight Week out in Vegas. Do you know if you're going to – are you going to take part in anything during that week with the UFC? I, I don't know. I have uh, – I, I got to wrap up the football season, and then um, I know I'm going to have another event or two coming up after uh, after football. I just don't know when it's going to be yet. So it'll, it'll probably be um, during the summer. So I don't – I'm not sure. Hopefully it'll be a, hopefully it'll be a good card, though. Yeah. What, so what do you do there with, with NFL Network for uh, Super Bowl week? You've been there all week. You – have a big set there. I know you. I've seen you on. I've seen your Twitter and checked everything. You, you're rubbing shoulders with all the big wigs, man. All the great players coming through the set. What do you do like all week as far as hosting and and even at nights? Like, do do you get to go to the events? Yeah. No. It's it's great. I I have a um I actually have a great schedule. We do our regular total access show and we'll do it from different spots. You know, we'll have a set in the Super Bowl experience. Last night, um, we did it at a place that looked like we were in an ice fishing hut. Um, we did, you know, outside it was, it was negative seven in, in Minneapolis when we woke up today. So they've had to adjust a few of the, a few of the sites, but they have different guests every day. You know, we had, um, we had Deshaun Watson did a little football throwing contest with him today. Just did something with, uh, Dak Prescott. Um, you know how it works. So you, the, the marketing guys run, you run you guys through and you, you run the gauntlet and you do the same interview 25 you gotta, times. So well, the, you have the tough job because you have to work in like, well, Hey, he's here selling, uh, Oinkos yogurt, and so you have to come somehow mention it. Right, Dak, right. Like Dak has to get back to. Well, you know, I, I, my arm feels great, but my arm feels much better when I get to eat my yogurt in the morning. Right, right. Just, you, have to, you have to pub his yogurt or whatever. It was all of them. Like Dak was loves Campbell's soup, and <laughs> you know we had Old Spice, and Travis Kelsey was uh, was Gatorade. Um, no, but it's cool. And then you know, last night it was fun. They had you know some of those 
big parties. EA Sports uh, had a big party, and Imagine Dragons was playing there. And <laughs> it was funny. Uh, th- before Imagine Dragons came out, they had Kelsey playing Alvin Kamara in a game of Madden. And the first thing Kelsey did was bench Alex Smith and put Patrick Mahomes in at quarterback because that's his new quarterback. And the crowd like kind of went crazy. It was kind of, it was kind of funny to see. Um, but yeah, it was fun, man. You know, it, it's, it's a really cool week to be able to see all the people in my industry and um, see players that I've covered that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, by the end of the week, you know, you're, you're ready to get home and see, see the wife and kids. Cause it's, it's Sunday to Sunday, you know, it's a long one. So will you, will you, I'm going to release this after the Super Bowl a couple of days later, but will you be watching the Super Bowl? Did you watch from your house in California? Yeah. So I'll, I, I normally stay for the game. Um, and I, I do post game stuff this year. They switch things around a little bit and they are, they're always worried about the weather. So I have to do the Monday show in studio and they can't have you missing a flight if you're supposed to be in studio Monday. So, um, yes, I will be watching it at my house because the last time, uh, when the Super Bowl was in New York, when I went back early, um, <laughs> I went to a Super Bowl party and it was a disaster. Like you, I couldn't hear the game. So I told my wife, I said, baby, you can stay, but I, I'm going home. <laughs> like I, I, I got, I, I don't care about, you know, the commercials. Like I just want to, I want to hear, the announcers, I want to be able to be dialed into what's going on. So um, I'm assuming it, it'll it'll probably be me and, and my son hanging out. And my wife and daughter may, uh, may go to a Super Bowl party or something. Well, you're telling me you're not going to record all the commercials and go over them on Monday on your show and talk about how <laughs> hilarious they are? I, you know, I, I want to know because it's – this is like an old man talk right here. The water cooler conversation, yeah. you know, like there's people don't even hang out by the water cooler anymore, I guess. But um, I want to know like the ones that people are talking about, you know, so, so I can have an idea what's going on. But I usually, uh, when I, usually when I watch the Super Bowl, it's at the game in a green room, you know, uh-huh. and, um, and sometimes you get a backhaul feed and you can't, you can't even hear the commercials. So if, if you do stay there for NFL network, are you in the stadium? Yeah. But yeah, you, so we'll, you don't get to walk out on the field or like watch from the sidelines or anything? No, they're super tight for the Super Bowl. So they now have credentials that you have to – it's like a scanner at a grocery store. They scan your barcode, and if you don't have uh, – if you're not doing a job on the field, you can't – it doesn't – you cannot get on the field. Um, so, you know, you'll have pregame access, and you'll be out there, and then 15 minutes before they kick you off. The one thing we do try to do um, – is go out there for the halftime show and, and get to see a little bit of that. But usually you got to be kind of sly about that too. So, so do um, you know how many Super Bowls you've been to, or at least you've worked? Yeah, I've been to, uh, I've been to either 13 or 14 Super Bowls. Which one, and, what was the best location? Oh man. Well, so <clears throat> the year that the Patriots, uh, had the perfect regular season, and the Giants won the Super Bowl because of the the David Tyree helmet catch. Um, I was working for the NBC station in Washington D.C., and they they bring the media down. So instead, you know, the press box is full, and they give most of the media like a regular ticket, like nosebleed seats. You have the worst; they call it the auxiliary press box, and you have the worst seats in the entire stadium. So you're at the very top, and then they usher you down into the bowels of the stadium where they hold you like cattle in, in a corral until the game's over and then like the trophy pre- presentation has begun and then they let you out and you can talk to guys on the field and get all the video you need. So everybody, everybody's always trying to figure out a way to get on the field early. And I saw this line of all these NFL PR guys, like the younger guys, so like the second and third PR guys for teams. And it was – I can't remember what year it was, maybe 07 – and I'm like, all those guys, are, they, they look like me. They're all wearing suits. Like, I'm just going to hop in that line. So I hopped in the line, and I was actually on the Giants' sideline when all that for the last five minutes of that game. It was incredible. It was one of my best sports memories ever. And I'm not even a Giants fan. I'm a Redskins fan. But I was like, this is I, – I, that helmet catch was just – I mean, my mind was blown. And the, to see the reaction on the sidelines was incredible. It's, that's much better than being on the Patriots sideline for the end, yeah, end of that I one, I would imagine. I'd pick the right sideline. And so then after the game, you go out there, and are you just free to grab any player you see and, and interview them? Well, on that particular Super Bowl, 
I was out there by myself and my uh, cameraman wasn't able to get out there. So I was just kind of walking around, like soaking it up, like waiting for my camera, like confetti in my hair. And uh, I acted like I had won the Super Bowl. And then my cameraman finally gets out there. And I always like getting the guys on the field, especially when you win, because it's you get that real, you know, that real reaction. And it's not you haven't had that cool down period in the locker room because um, you know how it is when you, you go into the locker room after the game, you kind of exhale you know you have a chance to kind of compartmentalize the bad and process the good and when you're out there on the field it's that's raw that's real especially after if you win the Super Bowl yeah. I would imagine most guys the, the guard is way down the season's over you hit the pinnacle it doesn't really matter there's no there's there's no repercussions for anything you say on the on the field post game Super Bowl unless you kill a guy or something you can say whatever you want as the player Oh, and they're just so happy. Yeah, it's just, you know, family's there, tears are flowing. You just get that raw emotion on tape, and if you can capture that, you get some really cool moments. What about a, a Belichick presser? You ever been in one of those? Yeah, I, I don't ask questions in Belichick you pressers. Never, you never <laughs> asked one? No. I Generally, um, because we have reporters, you know, who are covering the teams. Um, in, in the Super Bowl, we have two or three who are with each team. So I, I'm usually in there just to kind of – see what's going on and, and, and hear the press conferences. And um, I, I've been lucky enough um, to be able to, to chat with Belichick a few times, you know, away from the cameras. And I've always been with somebody who Belichick has is, is, is liked and respected, you know, Willie McGinnis or somebody else that I work with. And um, Belichick's been great. He's, a, he's an awesome storyteller, uh, really cool, normal, down-to-earth guy. So – I feel like if I ever asked a stupid question at a press conference, I, I would I would get my my card yanked by Belichick next time we visited. <laughs> he know don't you think he's aware and he knows what he's doing? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Before I knew him a little tiny bit off the field, I'm like, why does he do that? Because I I don't like I don't like when people embarrass reporters in press conferences on purpose. Like, just be respectful. Mm -hmm. And but I think with him. And maybe we do give him a pass just because he's Belichick and, and he's the GOAT. Um, but I think you just kind of know what you're going to get. You know, there was, a, there was a press conference earlier this week where it was a, it was a Spanish reporter um, asking a couple of questions about Brady and comparing Brady to Diego Maradona, a uh, famous soccer player. And – you know, it, was a, it took a long time to, for the question to come out. And the, and the guy, you know, was trying to formulate his words properly in English. And um, Belichick answered by saying, there's no other quarterback I'd rather have than Tom Brady. Yeah. That was it. That was it. <laughs> I mean, he could have played with it a little bit, you know. And he just, he just doesn't. He, he doesn't. Unless you ask him about, like, uh, you know. A, a, a Special certain, teams. Yeah, punt return formation or something. like, or, And then he's in, right? He's going to go off for five minutes. Yeah, just ask, you got to ask him. Yeah, I don't. I can't imagine a question that you would want answered that Belichick would actually answer. Like the only questions no. he's going to really go in depth with. It's true. If you ask him, like, well, what do you? What did you see there out of your punt protection? Then he may talk for an hour. And he could, and he's, and then everybody, you know, they're filling up their notebooks with all the stuff that they're really never going to use. No, no one even understands it. Like, you can't <laughs> understand the, what you're talking about with the personal protector does on punt and how the diff, all the different call. We got, well, we had man side on left and zone on the right, and they brought their gunner. Like no one gets that, and no one you're not going to write a story about that. Yeah, no, that I, I think I think he enjoys that too because he he knows exactly what he's doing, and he's eating up all the time in the press conference, <laughs> you know, with that stuff. So you can't ask the other questions; he's not going to answer. Did you go to the? It was once called media day. Now it's called what? The opening opening night? night. Did you do yeah. that? Yep. We did that. Um, that was pretty cool. It, you know, it's, it's interesting to see. This is the third time that they've done it. And, you know, Brady and the Patriots have been through this before. And even though he's still wearing the gloves, which is so common. And then the me. one glove, he wore the and one, the glove, one glove. glove. Right. He was Michael Jackson the other day during his press conference. Um, the look in the eyes of Nick Foles and the Eagles players who kind of for the first time, you know, I don't know if that just hit them at that moment when they came out on stage. Um, I think it's kind of cool. I like it. I, I think they should even make it more kind of WWE or, or, or UFC. You know, I, I'd love to see like, 
like Joe Rogan, you know, during the weigh in, come out there and just I'd make it because it, it already is big. But you get somebody like that to be a part of it and, you know, have a have a stare down between Brady and Foles. That'd be <laughs> <Come> awesome. <on. laughs> That'd be crazy. I mean, it'd be awesome if they actually did it. I don't know if you could actually get guys yeah. to do that. No, and jump in, the, get it, it'll really play in the game. I mean, you can get Gronk up there; he'll do it. Oh, Gronk! See, maybe you could just have like one person do it. Gronk would definitely. Do no, that. what it, what would be gold is if you get you'd get Peterson Belichick face off. Oh gosh, stare down. He'd be like, Bill, <laughs> ask him, and then you're in the you're right behind him. Like, hey, Bill, can you like hold your fist up? Like, hold your Dukes up? <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? Dude, I think we've created something here. I, th- I think we can work on this. Yeah, maybe uh, Popovich will run it. Popovich comes and MCs the event for you. <laughs> really, a bunch He'll of give us a lot. A bunch of dynamic on-camera personalities <laughs> in there. That would be amazing. Oh my God. Well, Pop, uh, I'm sure I've never, I've never uh, had the chance to cover Pop, but I'm sure he's, uh, he's a lot like Belichick off, uh, off camera. You know. Yeah, he. <laughs> He, Pop seems amazing too, but the one thing Pop does differently, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get you out of here in a second. But Pop, the one thing that he actually is a lot different, I think, is Pop has the same back and forth a little bit with reporters, but Pop's not scared to go into politics now. And Belichick, yeah, won't touch him, but Pop is now he's all in, full go, giving his exact opinion on what he feels is going on in the country right now. You know what? I feel like that's the NBA too, right? Steve Kerr does the same thing. You're right. And I think NBA players – now, this is the first year, right, with all the stuff that's happened on the field and the kneeling and the stuff where, where NFL players are feeling like it's their obligation to do more of this. But um, they've been doing it in the NBA for longer, and I don't know if it's just a different um, – a different feel, but they certainly take more liberties when discussing those type of things with, with the media, I think in in the NBA. Yeah. Maybe it's something just due to sheer numbers. There's only what 12 guys on the team and really each, each team, the, 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 there's two superstars or one that is really marketed as, Hey, watch Steph Curry play LeBron James. So those guys have, uh, I mean, the amount of power that they have is unbelievable. So they're not, they're not worried about NFL guys that at all times, I feel like you're still, no matter who you are, you don't want to say anything to upset your head coach and your GM and owner too. Well, I mean, I hate to boil it down to something as simple as money, but you know, their, con- their contracts are <clears throat> just lost my voice. That's not good. I felt like uh, Sean McDonough in that Uh-oh. game when he voice <laughs> crap. Um, you know, the, the, they have the guaranteed contracts, right? And in the NFL, mm-hmm. you really don't. I, I got into a little debate with uh, one of our guys the other day. And we were talking about Kirk cousins and, um, the, the Alex Smith contract that was 71 million guaranteed. And he goes, that's not really guaranteed. I go, well, it's guaranteed for injury. He goes, yeah, but M- NBA contracts, major league baseball contracts, those, those are guaranteed for guaranteed nothing to do with injury. So big difference. Huge, huge difference that people don't, don't understand. I guess you're right. You see a hundred million dollar contract. You think he's getting a hundred. Uh, I don't know. Peyton Manning, he would play out contracts. He, he got a lot of the money that he was owed to him over the years, but not many other guys get what what the actual number is. I feel like only I feel like it's only quarterbacks, right? General, mm-hmm. if you're a good quarterback, not I'm not talking necessarily franchise, but if you're a solid starting quarterback, above average quarterback in the NFL, you generally make most of your contract. Now they may tear it up before the last year, but it's usually it's usually just to create cap space and they renegotiate a deal where you end up getting most of your money anyway. Yeah, good point, man. All right. Dan Helley, I know you're at Dan Helley on Twitter. You're going to be everywhere. Everywhere we look, we see Dan Helley doing play <laughs> yeah, by play always. football, basketball, MMA, UFC fights. I mean, what can't you? What's next? Soccer and hockey? Guys, dude, no chance. That'd no? be tough. Why? If I, I, I tell you, I really admire the people that go, like, what, pay attention during the Winter Olympics. Guys that are calling, like, the heptathlon and, <laughs> uh, you know, curling. Like that, think about that for a minute, AJ. That that's tough. If you haven't done that before, now their analyst was somebody who will have played, but as a play-by-play guy, if you haven't done that before, it you are learning a foreign language. And for a lot of these guys, they end up doing it, you know, three, four months. Of course, they're preparing before the Olympics start, but they're learning a whole new language, you know, and they're talking about something that is is totally foreign to them. So. That's that's something I'm going to watch for in the Olympics to to see these guys in these obscure sports and how they how they call that. Well, doesn't does NFL Network have a relationship with NBC somehow? Yeah, because of Thursday Night Football, which is no longer. So now we're doing Thursday Night Football with Fox. But um, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, you never know, man. You may be in one of those booths in, <laughs> is it Connecticut where I, I, I was visiting NBC, I think in, in Stanford, wherever it is. And they mm -hmm. were, Stanford. they call a lot of them remotely from their little they do. sound isolation booths. Yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of people don't know, but that's a good point. Get especially... out there, man. Get out there. Do some curling, some, uh, the shooting in the ski, when you ski and shoot a rifle, what's that one? Is that... I think that's the heptathlon, I think. Oh, pentathlon. Man. No, the pentathlon. Is That's, next. That's next. That's yeah. next. Add it to the resume, Dan. See, I have something to work on now. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you coming on. All right, brother. No problem. See ya. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawk Cast.